Whew, hallelujah. You know, thank you, Angie, and thank you all for your patience. Um, the quickest way to get what you want is to stop being concerned about it. Amen. You know, some of you, how many of you want more money? Seriously, that's all the hands? Okay, put your hands down. How many of y'all need more money? Okay, that's what I thought. Stop worrying about it. Stop worrying about it. You want to, you want to, I, I can't look at anybody when I say this. You want a husband? Stop worrying about it. Stop praying about it. Trust that God has a husband down the pipeline for you. You want a wife? I'm looking at me now when I say that. <laughs> See, see, I think it, it's, it's in Matthew 16, I think it is. Jesus says that he that loves his life will lose it. Yes. But he that loses his life, and she, what makes me say that is when she said that about, about want, not wanting to be in Iowa. Right. Yeah. No offense. <laughs> Seriously, no offense. I love you. But, but I had somebody, somebody had to actually give me a prophetic word about the love of God and how he can transplant that into my heart for Iowa. Yeah. I hate the cold. Yeah, I hate the cold. Huh? Y'all ain't feeling me. If anybody ever detested the cold, it was Tommy Lee Roberts Sr. But how many of you know that somebody has to serve in Antarctica? Roger, it ain't me today. <laughs> but somebody is serving him in there. Somebody's got to serve him in Hawaii. Do I have any volunteers? Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. But trust God. I'm learning that. We all learning this morning. It's a delight to see you. I want to take an opportunity to welcome our YouTube audience. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you. For all of our first time guests that may be here as I look around the room, it's hard for me to remember who's first time and who's not. Haven't seen some of our people in a long time. Delighted to see you. Thankful that you came out and find it important that it was a priority for you to come to the house of God. How many of you know it's not easy? It's never been easy, but it is certainly not easy in our day and time. And so we're delighted that you came. Thank you for tuning in. We pray that you will be blessed by what you see. We invite you to get a Bible that's something to write with. Take good notes. Apply the word that you hear. It doesn't, doesn't profit you if you don't apply it. We invite you, if you're in the local area, to come on down. We're located at 1221st Avenue in the city of Coralville, Iowa, right off of I-80 at the Radisson Hotel and Conference Center. We'd love to have you come in and join us. Would you give our YouTube audience a hand, ladies and gentlemen? Amen. Glory to God. Let's pray, and I want to get into this so I can get you out of here. Father, we thank you, and everything that we've done up to this point has been to glorify your name. The glory that we get, we get from the reflection of who you are. We pray that our lives would be a mirror that reflects the image of Christ. We thank you, God, that nothing that we undertake can be done in the flesh to any success or any degree of success. But everything that we do, we submit to the power and the flow of the Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, I welcome your presence in here today. Your people need you. They need you. They need your touch. They need your encouragement. They need your love. They need you to just continue to embolden them against the, the forces of darkness and the power of the enemy. Thank you, God, that you have defeated Satan already. We're not trying to defeat him. He is defeated. And we enforce your victory in this realm, in this city, in this region and most especially in our lives and in our homes. We bind the enemy hand and foot and cast him out. And we declare that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If you believe that, can you say amen? Amen. 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 Certainly glad to be back in front of you. It's been three weeks now. Uh, last week I was here. We talked about the vision. Some of you that were not here to hear about the vision, I encourage you, we're going to put it on the website. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I don't know if it's going to be private viewing, but it'll be up there. Uh, we talked about the land and, and talked about the building project and the fund. And so we're certainly delighted about that. So I encourage you to hear more information about that. When you came in, I asked them to hand you a piece of paper that says at the top, Cedar Valley Church. How many of you got one of these? Anybody that didn't get one, would you raise your hand so we can make sure that you get one? I'll give you mine. There's a couple hands up. Just leave your hands up so we can make sure that we get you one. Do we have enough or are we out? Did we run out? 
Praise God, we ran out. Well, how many hands are up so we can make sure that we, we'll make sure we get some more for you next, on next week. I can actually have my ELT members, if you would give yours to somebody whose hand is up, I'll make sure that you get one. Can we do that? Raise your hand if you need one, please. That, that, uh, those sheets are important as far as I'm concerned. Somebody sent it to me. I read it and I thought, you know what? This is applicable to what we actually believe to be as a church. We believe to be these things as a church. So uh, don't understand. Please lift your hands if you need one. Don't, please understand me as they hand these out and finish that. Don't dare think for one minute that um, God doesn't know where you are. Everybody get one that needed one? God knows where you are. Uh, that's important to remember. I want you to, to remember it because I have to remember it myself that God knows where I am. Um, was sharing with, with uh, well, as my wife and I travel, uh, what we do is we share. And she'll tell you, she, I, I'm going to be very transparent, I don't care, because my put, trying to hold or withhold an image in front of you doesn't do you any good. And it certainly doesn't do me any good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Y'all are out there, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you to Bob Butler and Kelsey Colbert for covering for me when I was gone and to Mandy last week who did such a wonderful presentation. Amen. Thank you all for doing a, an amazing job. But I want to I want to transition. We've been talking about uh, learning the potential in every seed for quite some time since we moved over pretty much. Uh, how many of you know that's true? OK, then you can say amen. So because of that, uh, the Lord has now we are in June. We are at the midpoint on the calendar of 2018 uh, for the second half of the year. And if we go by uh, calendar days, we recognize that 2018 is almost, you know, out of here. Can you imagine that it's June already? Mm. It's going by fast. Um, I have my own theory on that. I won't get into out of the word, that is. I won't get into that right now. But Jesus said that except the days be shortened, and if a nanosecond was taken off of every 24-hour period, you and I wouldn't notice it anyway. But collectively and cumulatively in time, we would have lost a great deal of time and not even know it. Jesus is soon to come. And so we have to be well aware of that. But with that, as we talk and as we drive, uh, she knows the challenges that most of you will never understand about my life and her life as shepherds in 2018. In the 21st century, we have gotten to a place where we have to recognize that the things of God are not going to win any popularity contests. You're not going to be in the majority as it stands today. But there is a day when we will all be in the majority. And for those of my sisters and brothers that are overly spiritual in the sense that well, I'm in the majority right now, Pastor Tom. I know you are, but from a practical standpoint, you don't feel that way on Monday when your body's not cooperating with you and Tuesday when your bank account's a little slimmer than you thought and Wednesday when your husband's not acting right and Thursday when your wife ain't acting right and Friday when your kids ain't doing right and Saturday when the dog just don't want to do right, you don't always feel overly spiritual. Amen, somebody. Yeah. But you are still very much a spirit being. So with that being said, um, some of the, 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 the challenges of life, to be clear, what I go through, uh, what you go through, I go through too. I, she and I have just have to learn how to deal with them better than what we did in the past. Yeah. Anybody had a problem-free life? Somebody started to raise their hand. I'm going to call you because you, you don't live. Matter of fact, if you live a problem-free life, you're actually not living this life because this life was designed for you to have problems with. And in the design of the problem, it wasn't designed by God but by his enemy because he sowed corruptible seed into the earth. So because that seed has been sown, it must grow. And I'm just giving you a rehearsal here because I'm getting into an introduction of the next series that we're going to talk about. But because of that, those things must be dealt with. They must be dealt with. What I want you to see is stop blaming yourself for everything that goes wrong in your life. Now, for those of you that are happy about my last statement, don't get too happy because I'm going to tell you, you do 
have to shoulder some of the blame. So understand that there is a balance in life that must be attained to that can only come from a spiritual growth. Spiritually, we must grow up. I look at my, he's not in here, my grandson, my latest addition, uh, Miles. Is this the first time you've been at church since we've been gone? So Miles was born, what, almost May 10th, so almost going on four weeks. Thursday would be four weeks, right? So uh, he was born uh, almost four weeks ago, and I, I, I was kidding. Crystal sent me a picture yesterday, and he was sleeping. And since I've seen that boy, I can call him that boy. I don't know about you, but I can call him that boy. Like he said, don't call him that boy. <laughs> that boy's always awake. He's always awake. Just a little bitty baby. Well, the Lord teaches me lessons and silly stuff that seems maybe silly to you, but in something like that, he teaches me lessons. He said, and I told her that. I said, wow, he's actually, his eyes are actually closed. And, and this little baby has enough sense to understand, even if he can't articulate it because he can't talk right now, that there is absolutely nothing for him to worry about because there's, there's no reason he doesn't have enough knowledge to know that things are dangerous around him. And as believers, we have to come to the same place as a little child, trusting God. We know that it's out there, but we know also that we are protected by the power of the kingdom. And if we just use it just as as just words and it sounds good, it's not going to benefit you. You know, it's not going to benefit you. You have to live a conscious understanding every day that you get up. Like Pastor Nett was saying, when I wake up in the morning, you know, my first conversation is not always. Sometimes too many times I reach for my phone. Forgive me for coming down from your pedestal, but I'm not supposed to be on your pedestal. I am God's son. And so, but what I have to be conscious of, that when I get in my car, yes, people are hurt in car accidents every day, right? But in my car, there's something unique going on, and that is the awareness that the angels of the Lord, so, so if I'm in my car, I have to be, allow the presence of God to be in my car and not just let it be rhetoric or a good thing that we say on Sunday. Are you hearing me this morning? So with that, as we travel, we talked about things, and and I try not to talk about church when I'm gone. I try not to talk about church, and I I try not to talk about the issues that are going on in church. And my wife, I'm going to tell you, my wife, she's a darling. She is, she is, she is just like you see her. Ain't no pretense in this woman. She don't like me talking about her, but I don't care. She, I can do that. She's not up here right now. Um, But, but she's genuine. She ain't kidding. She ain't playing. Roger, she, she's always in my ear. Amen. How many of y'all married men can say amen to that? Okay, some of y'all been married, y'all ain't been married long enough yet, but trust me, she's always in my ear. But what she's doing is she's reminding me, she's not telling me about I, how, how terrible Tommy I am, she's telling me about how special I am to God. Amen. And you need that, you need that. For those of you that may be single, that's what the Holy Spirit is there for. If you don't have a prayer partner, if you don't have somebody that can call you, remind you of that, look, the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, listen, you are somebody. Huh? Uh, Anyway, let me keep going. So, (laughs) Robert said he talked himself. He talked to everybody else, too, but that's okay. (laughs) It's my brother. So last time we talked about spirit, soul, and body, that was before you, part, part five. This time we're gonna, I'm going to do uh, just a slight introduction to the fruit of the spirit as an introduction, because that's where this thing goes. That's where this thing begins to go. So the subtitle of this is Growing Up. Say Growing Up. It's time to grow up. And we've known this. This is not something that we haven't known. You know, we, we need to grow up. And again, our, our prophetic theme for the year is learning the potential in every seed in 2018. So growing up, growing up, growing up, growing up, growing up, growing up. What a, what a concept. Come on, think about it now. I'm a nostalgic guy. I like, I like old time stuff. I really do. Uh, uh, I listen to too much old time radio. I really do. But I enjoy it. I like old commercials. I was listening to uh, the other day. I was out in my car. And as I was washing my car, I was listening to it. It occurred to me that I wanted to hear something from a different era. So I decided to uh, listen to, now again, pull your religious toes in because 
If you're religious, you're going to be bothered by what I say. Tell your neighbor, don't be bothered by what he says. <laughs> so I, wa I wanted to hear some Vietnam era music. Because I, I wasn't, you know, when Vietnam started in 65, actually 62, uh, I know that's true, but 62, there was advisors in the, in the, in the, in the country. And then 65, when it, the conflict actually began to escalate, and then uh, all the way up really until 75. And for years, they wouldn't call it a war. They called it a conflict. Okay? Stay with me now, because really, the Holy Spirit is leading us somewhere. But as I began to listen to the music, I started thinking about how old I was when a particular song came on. And then, then a, a person that I, I've never heard, I know who they are, I've never heard sing, I've only heard them play a guitar, came on. And she was upstairs, so she doesn't know any of this. I didn't share any of this with her, right? You were upstairs studying, doing whatever you do, and I was down there washing the car. And I asked her if she wanted to help me wash the car, but she... <laughs> now, she will tell me when that car is dirty, that's for sure. But anyway, that's a whole other subject, and I want peace when I get home. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so, so I started hearing a song by Jimi Hendrix. Some of you have no idea who Jimi Hendrix is. I don't know. I don't have any evidence that Jimi Hendrix was a believer or born again. I'm not trying to suggest that or that he wasn't a believer, okay? Many times we make categorical assumptions about people without knowing them, and we think because they live a life maybe in the entertainment industry or they do this or that, they can't possibly be saved. You need to check yourself at the door. Okay, all right, we'll leave that alone. Talking about growing up. So anyway, I listened to the song, and you know, I thought, wow. And, and I didn't know. My phone was in the car, and it was playing, and, and I think I had one of my earbuds in or whatever, and I had never heard this man sing. And I thought, automatically, that's Jimi Hendrix. Now, it may not be significant to you, but again, I began to think about when the song was out, and I thought about it, and actually, when the song was out, I was seven years old. And the Lord didn't care so much about it being Jimi Hendrix, and he wasn't so much trying to bring attention to that song as he was beginning to work in me an understanding about what I was doing when I was seven. What were you doing when you were seven? Come on now, go back with me. I know some of y'all got to go way back, okay? But go back with me for a minute. Think about life at seven years old. Wasn't it pretty sweet? For the most part. For the most part. If you lived in a, in a functional home, particularly, hopefully, well, I almost said a Christian home, but a lot of Christian homes weren't very functional. I wish I could get an Amen. Seven years old, I didn't care whether it was functional or not. I didn't know whether or not my dad loved me, my mom loved me. I didn't know the things that they, I, didn't, I shouldn't say that, but, but as a seven-year-old, I didn't consciously care. All I cared about was getting on my bicycle, if I had one back then. All I cared about was, and I'm a country boy, running in the fields. I had a little cane pole, some of y'all don't know what that is, a little cane pole and a little crick. It wasn't a creek, it was a crick. A crick that ran through our property with two little ponds on them. And all I cared about was being out there with my dog, Sport, and my brother trying to beat my brother out there, Walter, who's, who's gone traveling ministry. I, 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 that's all I cared about. I didn't care about all the rest of life challenges. And then all of a sudden, I hear mama say, Tom, eh! <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> she called my name, and I knew there was three calls coming. And so I stayed there a little bit longer because I could do that. I didn't have to go to work. You know what I was like? I was like one of the millies of the field. In my thinking, I didn't care. I was just going to have a good time and catch me some fish. See, some of y'all thought this is a new thing. This has been in my life for a long time. And then next thing I know, I'd get distracted and start daydreaming, looking at the little caterpillars. That was before I was, you know, before I cared about germs. Y'all didn't care nothing about germs. Don't look at me like that. You know good and well you was making mud pies and eating part of it. <laughs> your mom. I know you got that fancy dress and looking good right now, but your mama had to dig you up. Get, girl, get up out the mud. <laughs> Come on now. And so then the next thing I know, I hear Tom. <laughs> that was number two. Now I had learned that there were three. Even at my seven-year-old age, I had learned that there were certain things that were going to be consistent in my life. And as long as I didn't break the rules, 
as long as I responded by number three, then what I had a reasonable expectation of what was coming, making sure that there was no number four. Because the next one after three, I had to learn this, and really I only learned it one time, but the number fourth was Tommy. You know that you get the difference. Because if mama had to call too often, she wasn't going to call but three times. Daddy was going to be the next one to call. Now, with that understanding, at seven years old, and I got all this from listening to a Jimi Hendrix song. With that understanding, I began to see some things about God that I hadn't seen before. So in the process of us uh, uh, growing up, you know, as a concept, it happens whether we want it to or not. Oh, glory to God. Can I help all of you, including myself, today? You are a week older today than you were last Sunday. You didn't, you, now some of you, <laughs> I have to be careful here. I don't want to generalize. Some of you may feel like, you know, oh, I feel great, I'm better. And you might very well be. But inside of each one of your cells, at the, from a scientific level, I should let you explain this. Inside each one of your cells, there is just a slightly larger flaw in them. From last week to this week. And no matter how much we're, we're, yeah, there she is. no matter how much you work out, no matter how much you run and exercise, and no matter how much you do calisthenics and you work on this body, you are still growing whether you want to or not. Some people will never grow beyond a certain time, a point in the calendar, particularly a year. I don't know what that is. Nobody in this room knows what that is. Somebody might be given a, 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 a date range by a doctor and say, well, you have X amount of time left. I challenge you, don't be moved by what time man tries to put on you. Come on now. Be like that seven-year-old running around with no shoes on and could care less that you were stepping on rocks because you know what? It's all good in the neighborhood. Come on. And so, but with that, what we have to understand is that as we grow, it's not, it's not, it's, it's inevitable not to grow. It's an automatic process that God has placed inside of us. Have I put you to sleep yet? Okay, let's move to another level. When God sees you and I in our lives individually, he has a plan from the very beginning. Yeah, amen. For each one of us. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. It's good to see you, Susan. He's got a plan for each one of us. That plan requires, say requires, requires. that you know it, yes. that you first got to hear it in order to know it, yes, that's true. and that you find the place where God wants you to be planted. Amen. Ah, help me, Joel. One of the greatest deceptions of the, of the 21st century, I'll say, is that we as humans think that we have a right to choose where God wants us to go. Right. Amen. I got one amen here. I might stay here because I might get a few more. Angie, Angie said it well, and I'm just piggybacking off of that. How many native Iowans do we have in the house? Would you identify yourselves, please, if you're native Iowan? Wow, give them a hand. Would you give them a hand? Glory to God. I am so delighted that you are here. That means God kept his promise, doesn't it? Now, those of you that are not native Iowans, circumstances and situations had to be orchestrated to get you and I here. Uh-huh. And circumstances and situations will have to be continued to be orchestrated to keep you here. Yes. But if God is in the plan for your life and you know the plan for your life is to be here, you will assist God by stop being so anxious for the things that you can't control. Yes. Amen. Amen. Think about it from the concept of a plant, if you will. I love plants. A plant cannot control its own destiny. 
The Bible says that we are the planting of the Lord. Trees, Isaiah says this, trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. So what happens is the plant that's in your house needs you to water it. Amen. How many of y'all let plants die? I mean, you ain't trying to, it just happens. You, know, you just forget that the plant is in the window, or you forgot, oh my goodness, oh yeah. Now, that's excusable if you did it once. If you do it twice, stop trying to raise plants and give them to somebody else. <laughs> okay? If you killed more than one plant in, the, in your lifetime, you need to stop trying to raise plants, okay? And dear Lord, don't get any. If you can't water a plant, that's a danger. <laughs> However, we as human beings can be excused for our inattentiveness. But we would never allow God to be excused for not coming through for us and watering our lives and providing nourishment and giving us what we need day in and day out. We would never allow God to get away with that. And yet we excuse people for doing it all the time. Somebody makes a promise. I promise to love you all my life. And then after about four years, five years, okay, we'll extend a little. I just changed. Come on now. And so we grow in understanding, but we don't always Manifest, say that word. Manifest. Manifest what we already have grown to know. It's just an introduction, y'all. It's just an introduction. Is that okay? Now, I did a little homework. You got to do your own homework, but I did a little homework for you today. That's a good thing that I do before you come, right? If I'm going to make sure that I talk to you according to the line of the Holy Spirit, I need to do some homework. There are 13 instances of the word or variation of the word grow in the New Testament. I talk about the New Testament because we're New Testament people, New Covenant people. I don't dishonor or disregard the Old Testament, but from a New Testament perspective, if you're gonna get a whole lot from the Old Testament, you're gonna have to study it on your own from this church perspective. Yeah. Study it. Yeah. I'm gonna give you, I refer to it, and I will go to it from time to time, but I'm gonna give you stuff that you need to know from a New Testament understanding. So there are 13 variations of the word grow, groweth, or grown in the New Testament. Now. The first scripture that I'm going to use this morning, you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. How much time do I have? 1 Corinthians 13. If you have your Bibles, turn to that. 1 Corinthians 13, chap, uh, chapter 13, verse 11. Okay, thank you. When you have it, say amen. Those of you that still don't carry Bibles, I don't know what you're waiting on. I guess when they tell you they outlaw them, then you'd be trying to scramble to find one. Oh, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> Y'all must be from Life Point or something, man. Y'all like, oh, yes, they will. God bless God. <laughs> Lighten up. First Corinthians 13, chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 11. It's up here on the board. Uh, do you guys have the message of translation? Or is that... You guys, okay, all right. I'm going to read this from the message translation. You stay with me. When I was an infant, or it says when I was a child, at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. Say that with me. I don't don't. yet see things things clearly. Okay, for all y'all super spiritual people to think you already got more insight than, 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 than you know, the, I don't know, the, the, you know, you think you know it all, you don't know, you don't know nearly as much as you think you do. Amen. And I start, that starts with me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. If I said this, y'all might get a little upset or y'all might understand the terminology, but I'm just going to be me. Sometimes I feel like I don't know jack as it concerns the word of God. Amen. I see stuff and I think, man, I know I've read that before. Where's that been all my life? Can anybody say amen to that? So he says, he says, we don't see yet see things clearly. This is verse 12. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. Say amen. Amen. 
We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us. Knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But for right now, this is verse 13. For right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Well, what consummation is he talking about? The full consummation, I am a spirit being. I live in a body. I have a soul and I live in a body. So do you. Uh, as my friend Reverend Butler would say, I have three hearts. Okay? Now, with that being said, I don't tap into God from a, listen to me now, from an understanding standpoint, I don't know how this heart taps into God because it's a physical pump. But I do know that God's got my heart, according to his word, in his hands. I want to trust in that. My heart starts, you know, fluttering or whatever. Some of you may have had to deal with heart issues. And the first thing the devil tells you is you're having a heart attack. Isn't that right? So I want to know that that heart, God's got that heart. My spirit man has a heart. Huh? What is it? What is it? Huh? The throne. My spirit man has a heart that's been given to me. And I'm going to submit to you that it's the heart of God. It is the pure essence of the Holy Spirit. And so because of that, I know that my heart, spiritual heart, is always okay with God. Unless I walk away from him. Mm, Okay, I got to be careful because I take me off the track. And then my soulish heart is where? Emotions. My seat of understanding that God has given me. I know when my attitude is bad. Now, if I said it this way, I know when my heart is bad towards my wife. Come on now. Isn't that right? You, you know, because ultimately God has to God. God is not God's not creating. He's not creating something unique in you that he hasn't already given me to. There's only one blueprint for humankind. The only variation is that he made them both male and female. (laughs) Y'all know I ain't going to let that go. I saw a sign that I guess June is Pride Month. And So I saw a sign that said, I wasn't, no, uh, I was made this way. No, you weren't. Because the Bible says, let God be true and every man be a lie. If it says in the beginning he made them male and female, that's exactly what has happened. Don't get politically correct on me. It ain't going to fly in this church. But for right now, verse 13 says, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Here's the three things. You need to write these down. You need to write these down. Again, this is just introduction. Trust steadily in God. Ah, I could preach here all day long and still have not enough time to say it. Trust in God. James says that that with our tongue, we bless God and curse men. But I say I'm trusting God. If I trust God, I stop being concerned. Like Pastor Ness said, Matthew 6, 33, about what I'm going to put on or wear tomorrow. Now, I'm going to I'm going to be real transparent. I have had a significant struggle since we moved from Tiffin over to Iowa, over to Corva. I'm just being truthful. I've had to, I've had, there's days when I've had to go into my office and I close everybody out, including my dog. Ain't no awe. He needs to stay on the outside. I don't know about your dog. My dog likes to belch. I'm like, you rude little thing. (laughs) Rude. (laughs) You know, or he likes to lick. 
and he'd be licking his fur. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's like a chalkboard for some people. He starts licking his fur. I'm like, get out. Get out. <laughs> but what I'm doing is I'm having to isolate myself in a place where I didn't expect me to be. I didn't expect me to have a challenge on this side from a simple seven mile move and all of a sudden find that I'm in a place that I've never been in before. I have to trust steadily in God. It is a sign of maturity. <laughs> Number two, hope unswervingly. Hope unswervingly. Hope without compromise. Hope without being wishy-washy. Hope without vacillating. I hope, and my, my, not just hope as in I'm wishing. There's a difference. My hope is in the Lord. The Bible says that he that hath begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. He gives you both the will. Huh? Ah. His plan is to get you where you could not get to on your own. Just like that plant. I need to help them little plants out. Sometimes plants die. My little kid, my grandkids brought me some plants and I worked valiantly to keep them plants alive. Couldn't do it. I don't know what happened to them. They're in that great plant heaven, I guess. <laughs> but they're gone. I remember them. I got a plant that uh, from, from uh, 2004. What's that, 14 years? Some of y'all may have plants older than that. There was a plant that was brought to our daughter's memorial service. Where's Cynthia? Wait a minute. And I, I, I <clears throat> get busy sometimes, you know. Sometimes that's what shepherds do. They get busy. And uh, I looked at it one day, and it wasn't doing as well as I knew it should. And she'll tell you, I'll dig that sucker up, and I'll give it all the nourishment that it needs. I'll change the soil, fertilize it, do all those things. But that plant was going to stay alive. It was important to me. Still is important to me. And... Uh, so I called on Cynthia. I said, Cynthia, come here, darling. She stayed there. And so Cynthia took that plant, huh? Plant master, plant master she called it. <laughs> if you know Cynthia, that's a true title, among many others. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, she took it and she brought it back to me and she had done such a masterful job. She put a, put a nice little piece of lace around it and just decorated it all so pretty and everything. And I, I told that plant, I said, don't you ever die or get close to death on me again. Now, that's a good place if I had time, I won't do it. But remember Jeremy, Jeremy Pearson's story about his project, yeah. his faith project yeah. about a plant? That's pretty good. I, I'll say this much of that. Jeremy Pearson, anybody, anybody not know who Jeremy Pearson is? Jeremy Pearson is Kenneth Copeland's grandson. And he was relaying a story at one minister's conference a couple years ago. And he was talking about, you know, when you live by faith, everything is faith. Right. Not just part-time. Too many part-time faith people. I'll say it one more time. Too many part-time faith people. Amen. And part-time faith doesn't work all the time. Anyway, so he was telling the story about how his, his mom and dad, uh, Pastor George and Terry Pearson, pastors of Eagle Mountain uh, uh, Church in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Anyway, and he was talking about how they had a class project at school, and his class project was to have plants. And I'm leaving a lot out, but just for sake of time, he had two plants. One he talked to and spoke to and prayed over and encouraged. One he just left alone by itself and put them both in the same place. And at the end of whatever the period of time was, the one plant, both, everything being equal, Everything being equal. What well, is a good illustration now? Everything being equal. Heard the same, I mean, had the same potential, except one was not talked to, the other one was talked to. And that one that was, talk, that was talked to outgrew and was so beautiful, and the other one looked like it, it, it just, it, 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 there was nothing there. But that was the only difference. It was watered, had the same sunlight. What am I saying? The, the reality of who we are has everything to do with who we, how we have grown and how significant words and this life is to us. To trust steadily in God, right? And to, and to unwaveringly make sure that we're following what God has called us to follow. Right. Unswervingly. The last one is to love extravagantly. Love extravagantly. 
love extravagantly. Many of us don't. Many of us have a variation of love that only goes into our comfort zone. I have never found it comfortable to love people who I feel like have done me wrong. I've never, I've never found it comfortable to love people who I feel like have done me wrong. Whether they've done me wrong or not is not on them. It's on me. Jesus never holds them to, to say what they did to you. He says, listen, before you bring one, one little farthing, this is my word, not his, before you bring any offering to me, go and make it right with your brother. And, and, and I, I've grown weary, Roger, I'll just say it like this. I've grown weary of people, church people that want to come to me and tell me about somebody that did them wrong in the church. Well, that's what they're supposed to do you wrong. Huh? Where you feel it the most. Yeah. yeah. I don't expect Kelsey to do me wrong. No. And it doesn't make Kelsey a sinner if he does do me wrong. No. Oh, Lord. Hey, Jesus. It makes him human. Yeah. Now, if Kelsey repeatedly does me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we got to have words. Because repeated wrong is abuse. And I'm not going to be abused by anybody, nor should you. That's why y'all need to stop pushing up against the pastors that make y'all come up and publicly tell y'all business before the church. Won't happen at this church. I don't want to hear your business anyway. I sure ain't going to let everybody else hear your garbage. Uh, you know, it would, be, it would be funny if it wasn't true. Sat down with a guy last weekend, last Saturday, and he told me what his struggle was. I'm not going to get into that. That's none of your business. And, and, and they don't go to this church. But he said that his pastor made them come up front and tell everybody what they did wrong. I don't know why y'all look like that. I, I, many churches still do that. You better tell Jesus. All right, I better stop because I see yawns going on and all this other stuff. I better move on. <laughs> so love extravagantly. And the best of the three, the Bible says, is love. Uh, the Bible says you shall know them by their what? Let's look at that just for a minute. Turn with me to Matthew 7. Are you okay? <clears throat> Matthew 7, verse 16. You shall know them by their fruit. The words of Jesus. I got to hustle because I'm running out of time, but I'm going to take my time. I ain't in no rush. When you have a say, amen. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Who's talking? Come on, who's talking? Y'all sleep or what? Who's talking? Do men gather grapes of thorns? Answer that for me. Come on. Do men gather grapes of thorns? No. Some of y'all ain't never touched a thorn or a grape in your life. You don't know. Okay, we're telling you not. Or figs of thistles. Say no. You can't do it. Can a pig have a lamb? Can an orange tree produce apples? Can a man have a baby? I did. <laughs> no. Stay with me now. Are y'all really okay where we going? Y'all okay? Can a woman be a man? No. No, it don't. No, it don't. He said that depends on who you ask. No, it don't. Can a man be a woman? Is not possible. Now, who's telling the truth? Them? Like he said, who you ask? Or, or Jesus? Jesus. This is important, okay? Verse 17 says, even so every good tree brings forth what kind of fruit? Good fruit. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot, cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
Verse, excuse me, 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. There is no purpose for you and I showing up, calling ourselves Christian, and we are not producing good fruit in God's kingdom. We, there's an inevitable, an, an inevitable uh, 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 end for us if we don't understand that if we're producing bad fruit, and this is why we're going to go into the fruit of the Spirit. I can't be a messenger of peace and always got chaos going on around me. I, I, I can't be long suffering and I'm the most fretful, touchy, impatient person in the house. Even if it is your house. It's my house. I can do what I want. Every tree, verse 19, that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down, cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Yes. You can read the rest of it on your own. Verse 21 is real good, isn't it? And it puts it in context because now what Jesus is looking for is fruit bearers, yes. not Christians. Right. Yes. Fruit bearers. Yes. People who are non-judgmental in the sense of criticism. Always got something negative to say. Ain't nothing positive ever coming out their mouth. I call them religious. I better keep going. Y'all okay? I'm almost finished. They showed me how much time I got, so I better hustle. Again, it's just an introduction. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. <laughs> read, read down to, skip down to verse 23. <clears throat> Excuse me. After all these things, they come unto him and they say, Lord, we did this in your name. We cast out devils. We did this. 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 Jesus is not moved by what you did. He is moved by who you are. One of my favorite sayings I've been using a long time is well done is better than well said. Christians like to talk a lot, but don't do much many times. Mm. So, so what I tell you, verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Yeah, you did all these things. He says, I don't know you. Did, can I bring it to a modern day vernacular? Get away from me. You that work iniquity or unrighteousness. He didn't say you worked sin. You worked unrighteousness. Mm, yeah, thank you. Practicing it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and does what? Doeth them. I will liken unto them unto a wise man which built their house upon a rock. Who is the rock? Jesus. That's why now you can understand why the Bible's, Bible calls him the stone that the builders rejected. Uh, I'm going to get somewhere. I, I, can, I sense something in my spirit. I'm going to get somewhere. The rain descends, the floods came, and the winds blow and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Look at me. Listen to me, and listen to me carefully. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going I'm to do my best to be as honest, brutally, if I have to, uh, truthful to you and understand that there is no way. Stop believing that because you are a believer, because you come to life point, because you pray, because you fast, because you, you confess, that you are not going to have rain in your life. Rain is what helps plants grow. Rain is what confirms your salvation. Rain will come. The Bible says it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Does it matter what you think, whether you want it to be sunny always? It is not a reality of who we are as believers and sons and daughters of the Most High God. He that controls the rain controls your life. The devil doesn't control the rain in your life. It's supposed to rain on you. You're supposed to get wet. Just because you get rained on doesn't mean you're going to drown. And so with the rain, with the adversity, with the challenge of life, and I've told you this before as we built up to this, listen, the seeds that the enemy has sown into this realm are beginning to grow. They are growing in the Middle East. They are growing in various places. They are growing all over the planet. And it would look like somehow or another God hasn't been active. But I'm telling you that Jesus said, let the wheat and the tear grow together. Yeah, we may look alike, but we are not alike. I know who I am, and I am a child of the Most High God, and ain't nothing going to move me off of that. How you going to know it? Watch my life, baby, and watch the fruit begin to grow. It's going to grow. Lisa, it's going to grow. If it takes all my life, it's still going to grow. Some of y'all think, well, you know, I ain't growing. First of all, shut up. 
Second of all, get your mouth in line with God. You are growing. Think about where you were. Think about where you could be. You could be out there homeless on the street. You could be holding one of those signs at an intersection. And you know that if you had it your way and God brought everything back to your life, what you sowed, oh my God, you'd be a hot mess. But God is faithful. He's trustworthy. He's working overtime for you and I to grow. He controls the rain and the sun and, the, oh my God, over your life. I'm not talking about the atmospheric heavens now. Don't get it twisted. I'm not talking about that stuff that comes down from the, because we got clouds in the sky. That's your job, my job to control. I wish I could get an amen somewhere. I'm talking about that stuff that comes because I have been identified. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. And because I am God's child, there are things that the devil's going to put in my path to try to trip me up. But the Bible says that I'll, even if I fall, I will not be utterly cast down. I'm not looking to see stand up. I'm not stand up. I'm not looking to see who's got my back. I just know somebody has got my back. His name is Jesus. His name is God. When I don't feel him, he's there. When I don't see him, he's there. When I am not doing right, he's still there. He cannot not be there. He must be there. His name is Jehovah Shammah. It means God is there. Everywhere he is. And although he may not be made Lord in, this, in that place where he is, there's somebody somewhere who's laying up in a hospital bed who has no other choice because they can't move, but they can call on the name of Jesus. Why? Because you're growing. It's his job to tell you that nothing is changing in your life. The devil I'm talking about. Remember, the Bible says when, when the master came out and saw that, 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 you know, good seed had been planted. And Jesus says, and, and well, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the parable, he says, master, who has done this? An enemy has done this. Mark 4. Stand up, son. Come here. The more, just turn around and face them. This is my son, her son, naturally speaking. By the time he was 17, help me, Lord, we had figured out that he was more God's than ours. And because of that, I couldn't impose my will on him. Some of y'all parents trying to impose too much of your will on grown folks and can't wonder why they don't want to be around you. You don't have to like it. That's OK. But what I began to understand that what I put in him, what she put in in him was not my responsibility to cause to grow it was my responsibility to put it in him to put him in the right environment oh my god help me jesus to put him in a place where he might not have wanted to be he didn't want to be in church but i made him be there it's not how you start it's how you finish doesn't matter. People want to talk about you because they don't like the way you look or the, tra the path that you travel. It ain't their path. Get off my path. It's mine and God's anyway. And so now, where is he at? He's grown. Oh, glory to God. Sit down. Okay, I'm finishing. I'm finishing. <laughs> the rain descended. The floods came. And the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell. And where I end this one and great was the fall of it. I'm here to tell you that his illustration is for Christians that build their house on anything other than the truth of his word. I, I, I wish I had more time, but I don't, but I'm gonna keep going. Is that okay? Bible says, he saith not unto seeds. Turn to Galatians 3. Ah, what a trouble can you ask there? Galatians 3. A couple more, I'm going to get out of your way. Galatians 3, verse 14. Okay. I, I, I sense something in here, but I'm going to. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. <clears throat> you got to stop being caught up in the constraint of time. 
when you come to church, if you don't expect, I, I plan on being out in an hour, just leave quietly, okay? Leave quietly. I need some water. I need some water. I need some water. Water. I need some water. Uh, please. Verse, thank you, sir. Verse 14. You got it? I'm going to read this from the expanded Bible. Christ did this so that God's blessing promised to Abraham, and you can write down Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3 as a, as a reference for those of you that know that a lot, of, a lot of students, might come through Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Okay? Jesus died so that by our believing, or by faith, we could receive the spirit that God promised. Say amen to that. Amen. Brothers and sisters, verse 15, let us think, listen now, in human terms, or of an example from everyday life, according to man. In other words, don't just think of what Jesus did. Yes, it was a spiritual truth, but it is also a human or natural reality. Because if not, if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, then, mm, take it out, then, then it would be unnecessary, unnecessary for a new birth. Let me say it again. If Jesus didn't come in the flesh, it would be unnecessary for a new birth because we could just live and die and the spiritual reality would take place. Yeah. Come on now, am I right about that? Yeah. But it was absolutely necessary for him to put on a flesh suit, even though he was God, and allow himself to deal with the challenges of life. Hebrews, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, uh, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And he also says that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings and our infirmities, but who was in all points tested like as we are yet without sin. So I say that because, listen, he didn't necessarily, mm, by my understanding, have a water bill due. But he had something due to the flesh that only he could pay. God, help me. He, 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 oh, God, 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 help me, Father. In other words, we've got stuff that we, either we create or we come into as, remember, I'm seven now. I'm seven, I'm seven, I'm seven, I'm seven. And as a seven-year-old, as a little boy, I don't care about skipping. I can skip, and I'm not going to skip. Randy, where's Randy? I'm not going to skip. I'm not going to skip. I'm not going to skip. But as a seven-year-old, I say inside joke, you have to get it later. But as a seven-year-old, I might be skipping through the field, and I don't care, you know, because life is good. You know, and, and then let's fast forward 10 years. As a 17-year-old, I ain't skipping no more because I'm too cool to skip. But yet and still, I still know inside me there's a little seven-year-old that wants to come out. But at 17, it's not cool to be seven. Feeling me. Are you feeling me this morning? So at 17 now, at 17, I'm prepping for really, I, I want to be 21. Oh, God. I want to be grown. I want to be a man. I'm a man. I'm a man. People call me a boy. I'm a man. At 17, I'm pushing hard on 20. And the next thing you know, I turn 20 and for, don't even know where it went to because I'm longing for 17, but now I'm 27. And at 27, I'm looking to be together with my spouse. Back in my day, I was. I don't know what they do today. I, I don't know about hooking up, and I don't know about all this other stuff they got going on. I ain't saying nothing about you living with somebody, but I'm just saying the Bible doesn't really bring a whole lot of clarity to me living with somebody. It talks about me being married to somebody. I'm just saying. Not a popular topic. I ain't say nothing. I just said what the Bible says. Come on now. But at 27 now, I'm pushing toward, next thing you know, I'm 37. And all the dreams of a 27-year-old haven't manifested at 37. Now I'm starting to feel something. Help me, God. I'm starting to feel weight. I'm starting to, and I don't know where the weight is coming from. And, you know, I thought I'd be a millionaire by 40, and that didn't happen. And so I thought I'd have uh, various career goals met by now. I thought I'd have a, this kind of marriage, and I thought I'd have this kind of family, and I thought I'd have this kind of property. And all of a sudden, these things are feeling, and they are coming due because the system is content on making sure that I'm never satisfied. No matter what I achieve, it is never enough. Enough because I'm going after the wrong thing and so Jesus comes and he pays the bill on the land he pays the bill for the for the family he pays the bill
bill for the health. He pays the bill. So it doesn't matter if you're 27 or 97. As long as you are in him, the Bible says that all things are within him and complete in him. With him, we have to do. I declare to you this morning that within him, the things that I'm looking for are still there. I just have to continue to move forward in him. I can't hear you. Truth always wins. Amen. Glory to God. What verse did I leave you at? You might know? 14. 14. You sure? I thought I read 15. 15. Okay. 16. Even, the, even in the case of human agreement, because this thing has, been, has already been dealt with, after it has been accepted, no one can set it aside. Let me keep going. God did not say, and to your descendants or to your seeds... That would mean many people. But God said, and to your seed, say seed. seed. Now write this down. Write these, these scripture references down. You can go back and study them for yourself because I don't have time to go through them all. Genesis 12, verse 7. <coughs> Genesis 12 and 7. Genesis 13 and 15. Genesis 13 and 15. Genesis 17 and 7. I'll repeat them again. Genesis 24 and 7. Genesis 12 and 7. Genesis 13 and 15, Genesis 17 and 7, and Genesis 24 and 7. Amen? What that means is that means that only one person, that person is Christ. This is what he, he means, he says. The law, which came 400 years later, cannot change that agreement previously made by God and so destroy God's promise to Abraham. So, as I conclude... <clears throat> At 7 to 17 to 27 to 37 to 47, now I'm right on the brink of 57. And at 57, the same things. Now, at 7 years old, I got born again the first time in my life at 8 years old. I did. Some of you may have got born again sooner than that. At 8 years old, I had no idea what it meant to be born again for the most part. I did. I got born again, but I, didn't, I got baptized and all that good stuff. Baptism doesn't make you saved, by the way. Um, so I got born again, and then as born again, being born again, <clears throat> I made it to 7, 8, 9, 10. Pull your religious toes in now, because I'm going to share some stuff that you may not want to hear about your pastor, but that man is dead, so I'm talking about a dead man. Amen. And at, before I got to my teen years, I had already experimented with things that should not be experimented with by anybody before they get married. Listen to me. Listen to me well. When I did, a seed was planted. The seed was planted. I didn't even know it. I wasn't aware that it was on board. It was there, though. I began to move. She's not even in the picture. I don't know her. I move into the teen years. And in the teen years, I'm living this life. <clears throat> Listen, now we're talking about growing up. I'm living this life. Remember, what, remember how we started? Uh, uh, Put your, put your finger right there and just, hear, just listen. Remember how we started in 1 Corinthians 13, right? When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good, right? Got that? Here we go. So when I'm now at 17, the seed that I planted before I got to my teen years has been growing steadily. And nobody has, has come along to say, uh, I got to be careful here. I identify in you something that should not be there. But not from a judgmental perspective, from a spiritual gifting that says, you are a daughter of God. And the Lord laid upon my heart that you were exposed to something that really you didn't even desire. But because you had outside influences going on around, it, it listen, it latched itself onto you. I want to tell you that God loves you. And I want to pray with you and take authority over this thing. See, now she's, only, she's too young to know what I'm saying. But, but see, when the mature ones step up in the house, they're not being critical, they're being observant. And so I say to you, you are not a victim of your past. You are not held hostage 
or captive or imprisoned by what some man did to you or what some woman did to you or what somebody exposed you to. Now, once I hear that, that thing that's been growing has something that battles against it. Here's the testimony of far too many people. No condemnation. Pull your religious toes in. No shame. No condemnation. Most of us haven't heard that until they come to a church like this where people start telling you that. Yeah, you made mistakes. You're supposed to make mistakes. Somebody would think, I just have made a royal mess of my life. Well, stop leading your life and let Jesus do it. And to be clear, even if you haven't made a royal mess, your righteousness is not good enough to get you in the kingdom anyway. For all spiritual hot shots that I think I got this thing pretty well figured out now, Pastor Tommy. Listen, you don't add anything to righteousness, baby. Oh, God, help me. Nor do you take anything away from righteousness. Righteousness is righteousness, and it stands upon the shoulders squarely of Jesus Christ. Shed blood, power of God. You can't save yourself. You can't deliver yourself. You can't bring yourself out of darkness. You can't deliver yourself out of poverty. Only Jesus can heal you. And, baby, when you try to do it, you and I mess it up. I'm preaching better than y'all saying I know, I said I was closing, that's why y'all ain't, okay. If you think you have loused it up, think again. Oh, Pastor, you just don't know. You're right, I don't know. Close your Bibles. That always helps. (laughs) It's been three weeks. I told y'all this last week, if y'all were here, I told y'all I was going to explode on y'all. Put that sign down. (laughs) <laughs> close your Bibles you can take notes close your Bibles the Apostle Paul before he got to be the Apostle Paul was his whole title Saul of, Saul of Tarsus okay that's important Saul of Tarsus was an identifier for who he had lived his life to become now it took me a while to, I only knew you as Lisa. I didn't know your real name. I won't say your real name. You didn't say, you know. Not, not that it's a bad name, I just didn't know it. When they would say, well, that's so-and-so, I was like, who is that? Oh, that's Lisa. Oh, I didn't know that. Because, because listen, because we have identifiers who determine and already shape us into what we think we are supposed to be. Yeah. Case in point, my name is Tommy Lee Roberts. There is a senior suffix on it because junior is in the house. Okay? Now, with that being understood, I was named, you've heard me say this before, after an alcoholic that, that my dad was buddies with. Okay? Kid you not. Now, I didn't get to know him that well. Thank God. He was, I'm sure he was a good man, but I ain't trying to be as a child introduced to an alcoholic. Nah, I better be careful there. Okay, so what with that, so I live my life with this Tommy Lee. Now, the word Thomas, the name Thomas, uh, the, the, the formal name Thomas is, means twin. It means twin, it means two. So I tried to change my name when I was coming along. I tried to change it to, I would spell it different ways to impress girls. I would, you know, you know I'd go by my middle name or, you know, TL, you know, whatever. You know, oh, don't, don't look at me like that. Y'all do the same stuff. Yeah? Some of y'all still do it. Okay, I, what's your name? My name is Eugene. What's your name? Well, my name is really Ralph, but anyway, anyway. So, so, so with that, with that, Saul of Tarsus is now been ingrained in the minds of other people about who he is because he's got a reputation. Say reputation. Many of us don't want people to know our reputation. Thank God he can fix a reputation. Oh, y'all, y'all been saved too long. Y'all been saved too long. Y'all been saved too long. Thank God he can fix a reputation. <laughs> okay, so Saul comes and he's on his way to Damascus getting ready to demand letters to, to persecute Christians. And on the way, as he's traveling, all of a sudden, bam! And he's riding and he's like, what just happened here? Hear me well now. In his 
encounter with the Lord, the Lord doesn't need anybody to pro prophesy or to speak words of truth to him. He doesn't need anything but his own timing to release to Paul, now uh, to, to, to Saul, who he really is. And he says to him, why persecutest thou me? And Paul, Saul, excuse me. The Bible doesn't give any indication that he was anything other than flat, either on his knees or flat on his face. But he had enough sense to say, I ain't moving because I ain't never encountered this before. Yeah. Now, Saul of Tarsus is probably wondering, dude, let's go. Dude, 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 let's go. Get up, man. Get up. You're Saul of Tarsus. You can handle anything. It doesn't matter. Hey, you're a bad boy. You know, you're, you're, you're a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You studied under the seat of Gamaliel. You are, you are a lettered man. You are, you are all that and a bag of chips. You are all this, all that. You got it going on. Get up, man. And the power of God is such that he says he has enough, enough spiritual insight and he's grown just a smidgen from where he was as a natural man now he is a he is he is he it may he may just be down like this and it just just barely shows increase but he has enough wherewithal to look up and say lord what would you have me to do i didn't know i was this man i thought i was this man and i've lived my life as that man but you have changed me you have made me a new creation in christ a species of being that never existed before and the old man is now when he walks away he looks back spiritually and sees the death of saul of tarsus laying on the ground saying never again never again i'm not that i'm not that I don't want to I don't want to go back to that. He says, forgetting. This is the same guy that says forgetting those things which are behind. See, at seven, I didn't know I needed to forget some things. At 17, I did so much dirt at 17 that I felt like I wasn't worthy to make it to 20. And the devil was there heaping it on me, telling me, you're no good. You're no good. You're no good. You're this. I don't care that daddy is a pastor. You're still no good. And all the voices of religion are saying, yes, that's right. You need to get saved. You need to get cleaned up. You need to fix this. I can't fix it. I didn't put it in there in the first place. And then when we walk up in a church that's got some, some faith in it, some power in it, we walk in all confused and I'm saying, fix me, fix me, fix me. And to be the man of God saying you have been fixed from the day you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. That man, Tommy, is dead. Look at me, son. Live unto Jesus. Die unto sin. Because you're growing up. Stand to your feet. I ain't run out of words. I ran out of time. 